Thank you. Thank you, Kobe. Uh, thank you, everyone. So I'm glad to be back to this, uh, this program. And uh, this will be the second iteration of our course on uh, geometric deep learning um, that we already taught in uh, AMMI uh, last year. So as last year, this will be taught by uh, myself with uh, my colleagues, Joan Bruna from NYU, Taco Coin from Qualcomm, and uh, Petra Vilichkovic from DeepMind. And uh, uh, you will hear from them uh, in other lectures as well. So I will start with the introduction that uh, I call maybe a little bit arrogantly the Erlangen program of machine learning. So we'll hear what uh, Erlangen program is and how it all started maybe many years ago. And the gist of the course is the fundamental principles that underlie deep representation learning and most of modern deep neural network architectures. And if I were to summarize it in just one single word, this word is symmetry. And uh, symmetry, uh, as defined by uh, Hermann Weyl, who was one of the greatest uh, mathematicians of the 20th century, uh, he called it uh, uh, the symmetry as wide or as narrow as you may define its meaning, is uh, one idea by which man for the ages has tried to comprehend and create order, beauty, and perfection. And it really highlights the important place that symmetry plays, not only in mathematics, but also in, uh, in physics, as we'll see, but also in the arts and other fields of science. And it occupied a special place for the ages, from Sumerian symmetric designs to Pythagoreans who believed the circle to be perfect due to its rotational symmetry. And in terms of uh, the historical overview that I would like to give in this lecture, it takes us back in time where, as Newton said, we stand uh, on the shoulders of the giants. So uh, in this first lecture, uh, it will be about how the notion of symmetry through the ages has influenced geometry, math, and eventually uh, deep learning, which is the main topic of our course and uh, allowed us to reach the, the point uh, where we are currently. So the term itself uh, has Greek origins, symmetria literally translates as same measure. And ancient Greeks used this term to somehow vaguely convey the beauty of proportion in art and uh, harmony in music. And Plato, for example, considered the, the five regular polyhedra, what uh, we nowadays call the platonic solids, so fundamental that they must be somehow the basic building blocks of the material world. And it was actually not very far from truth. And as was, as was shown by uh, the German astronomer and mathematician, uh, Johannes Kepler, he was actually the first to uh, attempt the rigorous analysis of uh, the symmetric shape of water crystals and wrote uh, a book on this called um, On the, the Six Cornered Snowflake, which was actually a, a Christmas gift to his friend in 1611. So uh, he tried to attribute the sixfold behedral symmetry of uh, snowflakes to uh, what is nowadays called uh, hexagonal packing of particles. So if you take balls and you try to pack them, you will see certain symmetric patterns emerge. And uh, this idea, though, it preceded the clear understanding of how matter is formed. So people had no idea about uh, molecules and atoms and crystal lattices. Uh, it still calls today as the basis of uh, modern crystallography. Now, if we already mentioned ancient Greece, uh, modern geometry also trace, uh, traces back to ancient Greece. And probably the most seminal work there is the work of Euclid, the elements. And what we nowadays call Euclidean geometry was in fact the only geometry that was known for uh, over 2000 years. And um, the core of Euclidean geometry uh, was a set of five basic assumptions uh, called postulates that were used to provide a, a construction of theorems and results in Euclidean geometry. And it happened that for hundreds of years, the fifth postulate about parallels stating that it is possible to pass only one line that is parallel to a given line through a point that lies outside of it. It uh, defied any attempt to prove it. And in fact, many illustrious mathematicians broke their teeth trying to, to, to deal with this uh, postulate of parallels. And for example, one early approach to the problem appeared uh, in the 11th century. Uh, it was uh, a work in Persian called the commentary uh, on the difficulties concerning the postulates of Euclid's elements. 
by uh, no, no one else but Omar Hayyam himself. I think nowadays he's mainly remembered as a poet and uh, author of the, the, the line, uh, a flask of wine, a book of verse and plume beside me. But he was also a mathematician and uh, he studied the fifth postulate uh, uh, and apparently was troubled by his inability to prove it. So this uh, work was uh, uh, also considered by uh, Italian Jesuit living in the uh, 18th century called Giovanni Sacchi. He was likely aware of uh, Hayam's previous work and uh, his own work was called uh, Euclides a Omni Nevo Vindicatus. So in Latin it means uh, Euclid clear, cleared of every stain literally or of every fault. So he tried to, to, to give back Euclid the glory of every doubt that was raised about, uh, about the fifth postulate and he considered um, an equivalent statement about parallel lines considering the, the summit angles of the quadrilateral that now bears his name where the sides are perpendicular to the base and uh, there, are, there are three cases for the top angles to be either acute or uh, right or, uh, or uh, obtuse and he concluded that in the case of acute angles that leads to infinitely many non-intersecting lines that can be passed through a point outside of it uh, so counterintuitive that he rejected it as repugnant to the nature of straight lines. So he almost constructed hyperbolic geometry. And in fact, this work was rediscovered in the 19th century by Eugenio Beltrami when it was already understood that this construction was not crazy and not repugnant to anything. It was really the, probably the almost first almost successful such construction. So Euclid, Euclid's monopoly came to an end in the 19th century. There was a remarkable burst of creativity. Uh, geometry was probably some of the most exciting fields of mathematics. And probably first was the development of projective geometry. So uh, the name that is associated with it is Poncelet. He was uh, a French officer. He participated in the Napoleonic campaign unsuccessfully in Russia, got imprisoned and spent his time prolifically in, uh, in Russian prison. Uh, during these years, he wrote a very comprehensive treatise on projective geometry. And projective geometry, um, it's a special type of geometry where points and lines are interchangeable. And there is no such thing as parallelism. Any two lines intersect at exactly two points. And it's uh, often not considered a non-Euclidean geometry, strictly speaking, but it was probably the first one uh, to undermine the, the Euclidean concept of parallelism. And I should say that uh, it was probably the uh, uh, reverse of projective geometry because obviously it's been, uh, uh, it's been known since the uh, Middle Ages and even since antiquity and, and artists uh, used it to, to draw uh, perspective uh, uh, projections. And uh, even there was the, the work of his compatriot Gerard Desargues, uh, also a Frenchman uh, in uh, the 17th century. So uh, Janusz Boyei, uh, a Hungarian mathematician, uh, apparently uh, was one of the first to get uh, to uh, ideas of proper non-Euclidean geometry. So actually the credit for it is disputed. Uh, it is usually attributed to Boyei, Gauss and Lobachevsky, but Lobachevsky was the first to publish. And uh, Boyei uh, famously wrote to his father in uh, 1823, that has discovered such wonderful things that uh, was amazed out of nothing created a strange new, new world. And uh, uh, his, uh, his father, he was also a mathematician, uh, wrote about these discoveries to Gauss. He was probably the, the, the main uh, mathematician of that period. He was called the, the Prince of Mathematicorum, the Prince of Mathematicians. But Gauss uh, replied quite tersely. He said that he himself considered the same ideas 30 years before, which was probably in the beginning of the 19th century, but he never dared to publish them. So he considered this field to be immature. So as I said, uh, Lobachevsky was the first to publish. So that was in 1829. And uh, in his work, he considered the fifth axiom, uh, axiom of, uh, or the fifth postulate of uh, Euclid, uh, an arbitrary limitation as an alternative. He proposed a new one that more than one line can pass to a point that is parallel to a given one. And such a construction, as it was later explained, requires a special space that has negative curvature, what we now call hyperbolic space or hyperbolic geometry. And this idea was quite radical and I would say heretical at the time of publication. And Lobachevsky was openly derided by colleagues, uh, whether anonymously or uh, 
before putting their name to attack something. And uh, yeah, it was not very popular and was not, uh, not considered to be a good mathematics. So if Gauss didn't dare to publish his ideas about uh, these new types of geometry, his PhD student, Bernard Riemann, did, and his lecture on the hypothesis on which geometry is based gave rise to uh, what we nowadays call differential geometry of surfaces or Riemannian geometry. And uh, he also constructed, as a particular case, non-Euclidean geometry on the sphere uh, that is sometimes called Riemannian geometry in the narrow sense. And in this case as well, the fifth postulate of Euclid doesn't hold nor the second one. So all straight lines have finite lengths. And uh, as you can, as you know, uh, you can take the globe. That would be the, the best example of uh, uh, this uh, spherical elliptic geometry. So as a result of these developments, what happened in the 19th century that uh, there was an entire new zone of different geometries. So uh, towards the end of the, the 19th century, they became disparate fields with the mathematicians uh, wondering uh, which geometry is the right one, what actually defines in geometry, is there any hierarchy, right? So there was a fine, projective, elliptic, Euclidean, hyperbolic geometry. So it was quite a, a messy situation. And uh, it was in this uh, interesting moment that uh, a young German mathematician called Felix Klein stepped in. So he was just 23 years of age when he was appointed in 1872 as a full professor at the University of uh, Erlangen in Germany. So it was a small university in a small town in Bavaria. And as it was customary, he was asked to give uh, an inaugural talk and write a research uh, prospect uh, that to accompany it. And uh, this uh, has entered the history of mathematics as the Erlangen program. And in this program, Klein proposed the project geometry as the study of invariants or symmetries or the properties that remain unchanged under some class of transformations. And uh, this approach was a radical shift in the way that geometry was constructed and, and understood. And uh, it gave immediate clarity by showing that different geometries could be defined by appropriately choosing the, uh, the, 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 the symmetries, the class of transformations that you subject your geometric shapes to. And for example, symmetries defining Euclidean, Euclidean geometry are rigid motions. These are translations, reflections, and rotations, and they preserve angles, distances, areas, parallel lines, and their intersections. And if you take a bigger symmetry group, such as the fine group or projective group, you lose some of these properties, but you get more general geometries. So for Klein, for example, projective geometry was uh, the, most, uh, uh, the most general one. And the language that Klein used to formalize the notion of symmetry was uh, the language of group theory. It was also, by that time, a new field of mathematics. It was born in, uh, also in the 19th century. So the first time it was used was uh, by Evariste Galois. Uh, it was also a French mathematician that uh, died very young. I think he was only 21 when he was killed in a duel. And he famously wrote down his results very hastily in a letter to a friend on the night before his uh, fatal duel. And group theory uh, nowadays is strongly associated with, uh, in addition to Galois, uh, with Klein himself and with Stockholm Lee, uh, who worked together and developed some of the basic uh, concepts of this uh, discipline. So uh, historically, maybe I should say that uh, though the Erlangen University is obviously very proud uh, of its association with Klein, he didn't stay there for long and eventually moved to Göttingen which at that time was uh, the world's leading place for mathematics. It's the university where Gauss himself had worked. And uh, the impact of the Erlangen program uh, on geometry and mathematics in general was uh, extremely profound. Not only uh, on mathematics, I think it had a cultural impact that, that spilled way beyond. And one field that was affected by these ideas in particular was physics. So uh, a person who worked with Klein and Göttingen was uh, Amy Neuter. And uh, she was a remarkable mathematician and uh, probably one of the most influential uh, figures uh, in mathematical physics of the 20th century. And she proved that um, every differential symmetry of the action of a physical system has a corresponding conservation law. And uh, this is really a fundamental and stunning result because uh, if you think of conservation laws historically, these were mainly empirical observations. So you would have to do an experiment where you uh, measure some property like energy, and you repeat this experiment many times, and you see that the energy is conserved, so you would draw this conclusion. 
So Noether's uh, theorem shown that the, the conservation of energy, for example, emerges from the translational symmetry of time. So it's rather intuitive idea that if you make the experiment today and tomorrow and yesterday, the result will uh, will be invariant, will be the same. Uh, and uh, uh, this was a really fundamental understanding in physics. And Weil himself, that I quoted in the beginning, uh, used these ideas to develop the concept of gauge invariance as a principle from which electromagnetism could be derived. And uh, uh, speculatively, he tried to unify it with gravitation. The, uh, interesting, there is uh, uh, evidence of correspondence of him with Einstein that, that argued that this construction was not physically correct. And with development of quantum mechanics, file uh, reinterpreted his concept of gauge invariance. And uh, it took several decades until this uh, idea in somewhat generalized form that was developed by Young and Mills in the 50s uh, became successful to provide finally a unified framework that describes all the fundamental forces of nature, maybe with exception of gravity for the time being. And this is what we nowadays call the standard model in particle system. And it unifies the description of electromagnetism, weak interactions, strong interactions in the language of gauge invariance uh, expressed in uh, group theoretical language. So this is more or less all the physics that we currently know. And I can only repeat uh, the words of another Nobel winning physicist, Philip Anderson, that said that it's only slightly overstating the case to say that physics is the study of symmetry. Now, uh, at this point, you may uh, ask the question, what does it all, all this uh, excursion into the history of geometry and physics? Uh, it might be interesting and exciting. What does it all have to do with deep learning? And uh, as we'll see next, uh, the geometric notions of symmetry and invariance have been recognized as crucial even the, in the uh, very early days of uh, artificial intelligence and pattern recognition. And I think it's fair to say that geometry has accompanied this uh, nascent field from its very beginning. And um, I think it would be an ingrateful job to, to uh, try to find a specific point in time when artificial intelligence was born as a scientific field. I think humans have been, I would say, obsessed with uh, trying to understand and comprehend intelligence. Uh, but what we'll try to do is uh, maybe a less risky and less ingrateful task of looking at the precursors of deep learning. And in particular, we'll be focusing on geometric ideas uh, in this field. And uh, this history can be packed into less than a century. So uh, probably about a century ago, it has become clear that uh, the mind uh, resides in the brain. And uh, research efforts uh, turn to, to try to explain brain functions, such as memory, perception, reasoning, in terms of the, the structures of the brain net networks. And uh, two scientists, McCulloch and Pitts, are credited with the first mathematical abstraction of the neuron, the, the, the fundamental brain cell. Uh, showing that it was uh, capable uh, to compute logical functions. And what happened in the 50s, in 1956, uh, the uh, legendary Dartmouth College workshop uh, was convened, where the very term artificial intelligence was coined. It was the initiative mainly of John McCarthy, who would become a future Turing laureate. And the premise was that every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can, in principle, be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. And maybe a little bit arrogantly or wishfully thinking, they thought that, that meeting for a couple of months over the summer, they could make important progress to solve these problems. And uh, we are not uh, even close to some of these questions uh, uh, since uh, 70 years. So uh, just a year after, in 1957, an American psychologist, Frank Rosenblatt, that worked at the Cornell uh, Aeronautical Laboratory, proposed a class of artificial neural networks he called perceptrons that were supposed to abstract in some way the way human brain works and learns. And perceptrons were first implemented on a digital machine then in dedicated hardware. And uh, Rosenblatt showed that they uh, managed to solve simple pattern recognition problems such as classification of geometric shapes. And he also proposed a simple learning rule allowing to train the perceptron to perform different tasks. And that, that was quite, uh, remarkable, and uh, it has led to a lot of excitement, not only in the field of artificial intelligence that was just being born at that time, but also outside the field, the, the 
the general broader public, a little bit similar to what we see nowadays, and maybe uh, a little bit of a hype. So uh, I can recall here the uh, 1958 New Yorker article that called perceptrons uh, a first serial, a serious rival to the human brain uh, if, uh, ever, uh, ever devised. So I think this can uh, make uh, only a smile, or even worse, the remarkable machines that were capable of what amounts to thought. So if uh, we hear about uh, ideas or, or discussions whether neural networks are conscious, uh, nothing is really new under the sun. So these uh, questions were asked 70 years ago. Uh, another example is the uh, somewhat overconfident MIT Summer Vision project that was expecting uh, a construction of a significant part of a visual system uh, to achieve the ability to perform pattern recognition in quotes like this. Uh, that was a new term. It's not official yet. During one summer uh, in 1966. And um, a realization by the research community that the, these initial hopes and, and this hype to solve intelligence had been uh, somewhat overly optimistic was just uh, a matter of time. And uh, in 1969, uh, this quick rise of connectionism, so the, the work on artificial neural networks, how AI researchers uh, uh, working on these uh, neural networks label themselves, uh, received somewhat uh, negative feedback that was uh, devastating in retrospective in the form of a book called Perceptrons by uh, Marvin Minsky and Sermo Papert from MIT. And um, somehow in the deep learning community uh, or in AI uh, history research, it is common to retrospectively blame uh, Minsky and Papert for the onset of the first AI winter, which made uh, neural networks fall out of fashion for, uh, over the next decades. And the typical narrative mentions the XOR affair, so it proved that perceptrons were unable to learn even very simple logical functions. And as a result, uh, they have poor expressive power and basically good for nothing. So I should say that if you really read the book, uh, it is probably one of the misunderstood and taken out of concept uh, works. And uh, indeed, some of the, the uh, statements that are attributed so uh, Minsky and papers were uh, completely taken out of context. And uh, some sources even add a pitch of, of drama to this uh, AI winter story, saying that, that Rosenblatt and Minsky went to the same school, and even uh, going as far as uh, saying that Rosenblatt's premature death, uh, he died in a sailing accident in 71, uh, was not uh, an accident, it was a suicide because he was devastated by the, the criticism of his work. But uh, the reality, as it happens in most cases, is probably more uh, nuanced and also more boring. And uh, far more plausible reason for this AI winter is uh, what is called the Mansfield Amendment in 69, which required the military uh, to fund mission-oriented uh, direct research rather than basic undirected research. And it means that uh, most of the efforts in artificial intelligence that were funded by the army, including Rosenblatt's research in particular, uh, because they didn't show immediate utility to the army, basically were cut out of funding, and as a result, it had a dramatic effect on the field. Now, if you look at the substance of the, the dispute and the accusations uh, on both sides, uh, what we need to understand is that what Rosenblatt called the perceptron is quite different from what Minsky and Papert uh, understood under this term, and they focused their analysis in their book uh, on a narrower class of single layer uh, neural networks. They call simple perceptrons and actually in the very beginning, they say they, they use this term in order of Rosenblatt, but it was not exactly the same architecture that Rosenblatt introduced. And uh, basically this architecture is what we nowadays call the perceptron. Uh, they compute a weighted linear combination of the inputs followed by a nonlinear function. Uh, Rosenblatt on the other hand considered a broad class of architecture uh, with features that some of which antedated the many ideas of, of what would now be considered modern deep learning, including multi-layer neural networks uh, with, uh, for example, random and local connectivity. And uh, we mostly remember the book of Minsky and Papert for the role it played uh, in uh, delivering this uh, devastation and despair to the early day connectionists. And, and uh, some people even complain about the lost opportunities. I think what is uh, importantly overlooked in this book, book is that it, it was probably for the first time 
a geometric approach and geometric analysis of learning problems. And uh, this fact is reflected uh, in the very name of the book that, that uh, as you can see, it was subtitled in tiny font though, An Introduction to Computational Geometry. So the full name was Perceptrons and Introduction to Computational Geometry. And computational geometry at the time was a radically new idea. And one review of the book that was from also from Cornell and essentially stood to the defense of Rosenblatt uh, wrote that this new subject of computational geometry would grow into an active field of mathematics, or maybe it will peter out in the miscellany of dead ends. And as we know today, in retrospective, computational geometry is obviously a very well established field. So it did grow into an active field of mathematics. But uh, also Minsky and Papert uh, probably deserve the credit for the first introduction of group theory into, into the domain of machine learning. And they proved uh, what they call the group invariance theorem, saying, stating that if a neural network is invariant to some group, then its output could be expressed as functions of the orbits of this group. And we'll define these terms in the next, next lectures. And um, they use this result to prove the limitations of uh, perceptrons, or what they consider simple perceptrons. Um, but similar approaches were subsequently uh, used by uh, prominent researchers such as Shunichi Amari, or uh, John Shaw Taylor, or Terence Zinovsky uh, for constructing of invariant features in pattern recognition problems. And uh, some of these early works that maybe are almost forgotten nowadays really laid the, the first foundations of uh, what we'll call the geometric deep learning blueprint. Now, uh, again, to the substance of this dispute about the expressive power of perceptrons, Rosenblatt probably could have rebutted some of this criticism uh, had he known about the proof of uh, Thirteen's uh, Hilbert problem. So Thirteen's Hilbert problem, it was one of the, the, uh, the, the famous Hilbert problem, uh, the, the, the important outstanding open uh, questions in mathematics, the beginning of the 20th century, formulated by David Hilbert. So the problem itself considered whether uh, the solutions of higher order uh, polynomial equations can be expressed by uh, simple functions. And it was proven in a more general version by uh, Soviet mathematicians Vladimir Arnold and Andrei Kolmogorov that uh, established that uh, a continuous multivariate function can be written uh, as, uh, as I show here, as a superposition of continuous function of single variable. And it was a precursor to a subsequent class of results that uh, were given the name of uh, universal approximation theorems uh, and um, uh, specific versions for uh, multi-layer perceptrons uh, in the machine learning literature um, were derived by uh, Seibenko and Kornick and, and uh, several other people afterwards already in the 80s and the 90s. And this is what we typically call uh, the universal approximation property in machine learning literature, the ability to approximate any continuous multivariate function to any desired accuracy by a multi-layer neural network. So in particular, uh, it was formulated for multi-layer perceptrons, unlike simple single-layer perceptron that was criticized uh, by Minsky and Papert. If you have a multi-layer network, just two-layer perceptron, these are universal approximators. So you can take any function, basically, the idea of the proof is that you can take uh, these kind of pairs of, uh, uh, of um, layers in the perceptron and uh, represent step functions. And once you can represent step functions, you can uh, decompose any function into steps of uh, arbitrary accuracy. Now, if you think of supervised machine learning as uh, a function approximation problem, where we are given the outputs of some unknown function, let's say in case of image classifier, uh, that would be something that tells apart uh, cats and dogs. And we are given a training set, again, inputs of images and cats and dogs. We try to find a function from some hypothesis class, for example, continuous functions that fit well the training data and allow uh, us to predict the outputs on inputs that we have never seen before, what is called generalization. And universal approximation guarantees that we can express functions from a very broad regularity class, in this case, continuous, by means of a multi-layer multi neural network. So in other words, there exists a neural network with a certain number of neurons and certain uh, configuration of weights that approximate such function, right? Uh, 
the mapping from the, the space of cats and dogs from space of images to the space of labels to any desired accuracy. So in principle, we can represent this task. But this result doesn't tell us how to find such a neural network, it doesn't tell us how to find such weights. And in fact, learning or finding the weights of the neural network has been a big challenge in the early days. And what Rosenblatt showed, as I mentioned, was a learning algorithm only for a single error. So, and the now ubiquitous backpropagation became standard only in the 1980s. Now, if we look at the uh, neural network learning through the lens of approximation theory, and some people uh, call deep learning a glorified curve fitting for this reason, uh, the, the answer, the, the question that we try to answer is uh, how many samples or training examples do we need to uh, accurately approximate a task, right? Like image classification. And uh, in approximation theory, we'll immediately see that the class of continuous functions uh, that multi-layer perceptrons can represent is obviously too large, right? We can pass infinitely many uh, such functions for a, a finite set of points. So there are even examples of continuous nowhere differentiable functions, such as an example constructed by Weierstrass, uh, uh, which have infinitely many jumps, right? So it's a kind of fractal function that, that is jumps crazy, there, so it's continuous, but uh, has uh, infinitely many cusps, so it's not differentiable. So it is uh, necessary to impose additional regularity assumptions, such as Lipschitz continuity, which is a kind of stronger notion of continuity. And in this case, we can provide a bound on the required number of samples. And what happens is that uh, these bounds do not scale well with dimensions. So even this nice and, and uh, friendly class of Lipschitz functions that, that approximation here is like, uh, and you can think of a simple example. So here we have a collection of Gaussian blobs that are put in the quadrant of uh, unit uh, square. Once we start growing the dimension, so the square will become a hypercube, we see that the number of uh, samples that we need to take will grow with the dimension uh, exponentially. And this is a, a class of geometric phenomena that are colloquially known as the curse of dimensionality. And the curse of dimensionality in practice in machine learning means that, that in uh, even small scale pattern recognition problems such as image classification, uh, because they deal with input spaces of thousands of dimensions, uh, if one had to rely on just on classical results from approximation theory, machine learning would be impossible. And in our illustration of uh, cat and dog classification, the number of images that we'll need to show to the neural network will probably be more than the number of particles in the universe. It will be humongously large, and simply there are not that many cats and dogs around to be able uh, to, to train on. So we need, uh, we need something else. And uh, the struggle of machine learning methods to scale to high dimensions uh, was also brought up by, by the British mathematician, uh, Sir James uh, Lighthill, in a paper that uh, AI historians call the Lighthill Report. And uh, in this report, he used the term uh, combinatorial explosion and claimed that existing AI methods could only work on toy problems and uh, would become intractable in real world applications that require higher dimensions. And he was very unhappy with the state of AI uh, at that time in the 70s. And well, in this photograph, I think he also looks quite unhappy. And uh, this report was commissioned by the, the British Research Council to evaluate academic program uh, research uh, uh, in the field of artificial intelligence. And uh, these pessimistic conclusions resulted also in uh, funding cuts. And together with cyber decisions in the US, that was a kind of a wrecking ball for AI uh, in the 70s. So that was really the, the real motivation for the first uh, AI winter. Now, for us, I think we will actually want to take uh, an optimistic conclusion from this. And this realization that classical results like functional analysis, uh, they cannot really provide an adequate framework to deal with learning problems. And uh, this will be the motivation to seek stronger uh, geometric forms of regularity that we can implement uh, in a particular configuration or wiring of the neural network, such as local connectivity of convolutional neural networks. And I think it's fair to say that the triumphant reemergence of deep learning that, that we, we have witnessed uh, a decade ago is at least in part uh, attributable to these insights. And uh, the inspiration for this uh, first uh, 
uh, new type of geometric architectures uh, came from neuroscience. And it was uh, a famous series of experiments that were conducted by uh, two uh, neurophysiologists working at Harvard, uh, David Hubel and Thorsten Wiesel, in the uh, 50s and the 60s. And that would bring them the Nobel Prize in Medicine afterwards in the 80s. Uh, and these experiments studied the structure and function of a part of the brain that is responsible for pattern recognition, uh, what is called the visual cortex. And uh, the, the experiments were conducted as shown in this, uh, in this figure. They presented changing light patterns to a cat and measured the response of its, uh, uh, of its neurons. And by doing it, this very meticulously, they showed that the neurons in the visual cortex have a multi-layer structure with local spatial connectivity. And a cell would produce response only if cells in its proximity, what they call receptive field, were activated. Not only that, the organization appear, appear to be hierarchical and the responses of uh, what they call simple cells reacting to local primitive, uh, like oriented step-like stimuli were aggregated by complex cells, uh, which produced responses to more complicated patterns. And it was, it was hypothesized that cells in deeper layers of the visual cortex would respond to increasingly more complex patterns that are somehow composed simpler ones and it was uh, initially semi-jokingly suggested that there would be a grandmother neuron that would react only when uh, you are shown the face of your grandmother and would be silent uh, in any other situations. And actually, I think in conventional neural network, something similar has been, uh, uh, has been shown a few years ago. And uh, this understanding or these first uh, insights about the structure and the organization of the visual cortex um, has really had a dramatic and profound impact on early works in computer vision and pattern recognition. And uh, one such um, uh, results was the work of uh, Kunihiko Fukushima uh, in the 80s. At that time, he was a researcher at the, the Japan Broadcasting Corporation, where he developed a new neural network architecture that was similar to the model proposed by Hubel and Wiesel that he called the neocognitron. So uh, neocognitron, uh, often it's misspelled as neurocognitron, but the name uh, suggests that it was a new version of cognitron, which was the name of a previous architecture that Fukushima suggested before that. And the, the neocognitron consisted of uh, what he called S and C layers of neurons. So its naming convention obviously uh, referred to the Kubel and Wiesel, the simple and, uh, and complex cells. Uh, they, uh, each such uh, layers were arranged uh, in uh, two-dimensional uh, arrays that follow the structure of the input image with uh, multiple cell planes. Uh, nowadays, we call these uh, feature maps uh, per layer, as you can see in this figure. And the S layers were designed to be translationally symmetric. They aggregated inputs from a local receptive field using shared learnable weights and resulted in cells in uh, a single cell plane have receptive fields of the same function, but in different positions. And the rational was to pick up patterns that could appear anywhere in the input, whereas the C layers were fixed and performed local pooling in the form of uh, weighted average. And this uh, allowed insensitivity to the specific location of the pattern. And as a result, the C neuron would be activated if any of the neurons in uh, its input are activated. And uh, since the main application of the neocognitron was uh, character recognition, uh, the crucial property was a translation invariance. And uh, this property was uh, really a fundamental difference from earlier neural network uh, architecture, such as Rosenblatt's perceptron. Yeah, and uh, in order to use a perceptron reliably, for example, you would have to first normalize the position of the input pattern, which was uh, a difficult task on its own, whereas a new uh, uh, neocognitron the insensitivity to the pattern position was kind of baked into the architecture. And uh, neocognitron achieved uh, this translational uh, insensitivity by interleaving uh, translationally equivalent local feature extraction layers with pooling. Again, will give formal definition to these notions. And this way, it created uh, a multi scale representation. Uh, we'll call this uh, principle of scale separation. And we'll also see why it can uh, also help to deal with broader class of geometric transformations, not only pure translations. 
And uh, Fukushima also made some computational experiments, and he was able to successfully recognize complex patterns such as letters or digits, even in the presence of noise and uh, geometric distortions. So you can see this is a, a figure from, uh, from his paper. And uh, we have the, the, the advantage of looking in retrospective, uh, what, 40 years since, uh, there has been a lot of progress in the field, and uh, I, I think it's remarkable that the neocognition has uh, a lot of characteristics of modern deep learning architectures. So first of all, it was deep, and in the paper, uh, he simulated up to seven layers network. Uh, it had local receptive fields, shared weights and pooling, and even used the calf rectifier for uh, value activated activation function, which is somehow often believed to be only recent introduction in the deep learning architectures. What really distinguished it from modern deep learning systems was the way the network was trained. So it was a kind of what he called self-organized architecture, essentially uh, unsupervised plus string-like approach, because backpropagation uh, had still not been uh, widely used in the uh, neural network community. And uh, learning of uh, neural networks uh, as I said, was uh, challenging, and uh, for many years uh, there was no good way of doing it. So Rosenblatt uh, devised a learning role for a single layer perceptron to train uh, deeper neural networks. Uh, there were other approaches. So uh, Ivakhtinko, Ukrainian uh, scientist in the 60s, proposed what he called the group method of uh, data handling, nothing to do with group theory. It was a, a way of dealing with polynomial, polynomial activation functions. And it allowed him uh, in the early 70s to train deep neural networks with uh, uh, up to eight layers. So that was quite remarkable if you think that uh, deep neural networks are something recent. Yeah, so that was 50 years ago. Uh, the breakthrough in the field came with the invention of backpropagation. So it's an algorithm that uses the chain rule to compute uh, the gradient of the weights with respect to the loss function. and. Uh, it allowed to use uh, gradient descent based optimization techniques to train neural networks. And as of today, it's the standard approach in deep learning. And again, uh, as it happens with many simple and important ideas, uh, the roots of it can be traced back at least to the 60s. But I think it's fair to say that the first convincing demonstration of this method in neural networks was the, the paper of uh, David Rummelkart in Nature from uh, 1986. And uh, the introduction of this um, efficient learning method was really the, the key contributing factor to the return of the neural networks to the artificial intelligence scene in the 80s and the 90s. So talking about Fukushima and uh, the neocognitron, so this design was adopted and further developed by none else but Jan Lecom. Then he was a fresh graduate from the University of Paris with a PhD thesis on the use of backpropagation of training neural networks. And uh, in his first uh, postdoctoral job at the at and labs, he built a system to recognize handwritten digits that were written on uh, envelopes. And uh, the system was supposed to help the US Postal Service to automatically route mail. And in his 89 paper, Lecom described the, the first three-layer convolutional neural network, actually, the name convolutional network was introduced only in a later paper. Uh, the, the, the architecture in, in the 89 paper was no name. And uh, it was quite similar in principle to Neocognitron. He also used local connectivity with shared weights and pooling, but it importantly forwent more complex nonlinear filtering, uh, the inhibitory connections in Fukushima's architecture, in favor of uh, simple linear filters that could be uh, efficiently implemented as convolutions using uh, multiply accumulate uh, operations on the digital signal processor, or a DSP. So that was about the time uh, when uh, these kind of uh, hardware architectures emerged. And uh, this design choice that uh, departed from the neuroscience inspiration and also departed from neuroscience terminology. So if you read uh, Fukushima's paper, it is written by uh, foreign audience of neuroscientists. If you read Lecan's paper, it's written for signal processing experts. So it allowed to move the entire play to the domain of signal processing, and that would be uh, really crucial for the, the future success of deep learning. So 
basically it fell into the hands of engineers and became uh, essentially a single processing job. So uh, this work essentially showed convincingly, first of all, the power of gradient-based methods for complex pattern uh, recognition tasks, something that, that maybe just a decade before would be unimaginably difficult. It was also one of the first practical deep learning based systems for computer vision. And uh, this evolution, uh, this architecture was evolved uh, quite significantly. So uh, SCNN with five layers that was named uh, Lonet 5, was probably a pun on the, the, the name of the first author, uh, in the uh, 90s was used by uh, banks in the United States to automatically recognize uh, handwritten checks. But uh, in the computer vision uh, research community, somehow the vast majority uh, was not convinced by neural networks for a variety of reasons and uh, looked uh, into a different direction for constructing very carefully designed and crafted uh, feature detectors and descriptors. And in the next decade, this was the, the mainstream of computer vision research, typical architecture for visual recognition systems uh, was. Uh, as I said, a set of carefully handcrafted feature extractors and descriptors. So typically you would detect some interesting salient points in an image and then provide their local description in a way that is robust to maybe mild perspective transformations and contrast changes. So the famous algorithm in that domain was SIFT, the scale invariant feature transformed by David Lowe. And then uh, these features would be somehow aggregated. So again, famous paper by Sivish and Zisserman, the, the uh, visual Google, uh, introducing the, the bag of features aggregation. And then you would apply to it a simple uh, classic, typically a support vector machine. <laughs> and uh, the balance of power, however, changed by uh, the rapid growth in computing power and the emergence of uh, graphics hardware, the GPUs that allow to, to perform general purpose computation, and also the amounts of available annotated visual data. And it became possible to implement and train increasingly bigger and more complex uh, convolutional neural networks and address uh, increasingly more challenging uh, visual recognition tasks. And the holy grail at that time was uh, in computer vision, the uh, image that large scale visual recognition challenge that, that was pioneered by uh, Li Fei Fei. And um, it was an annual challenge that consists, uh, consisted, and it is still it runs, but maybe it's slightly modified version. Um, basically, the idea was to classify millions of uh, human labeled images into about a thousand different categories. And uh, I see an architecture that was developed by uh, uh, Alex Krzyzewski and co-authors at the University of Toronto in 2012 managed to beat by a, a very large margin all the competing approaches in computer vision based on these handcrafted descriptors. And uh, Alex Netas, the architecture was uh, named in honor of its developer, uh, was a convolutional neural network. It was uh, significantly bigger in terms of the number of parameters and layers compared to, to its uh, uh, precursor, the Net5. But conceptually the same, and probably the main difference was the use of uh, a GPU for training. And again, they were not the first to do it, but it was probably the most convincing application of GPU for, uh, use for deep learning. And the success of CNNs on ImageN became really the turning point for deep learning in computer vision, and uh, it signaled its broad acceptance in the following decade, and uh, multi-billion industries emerged as a result with deep learning successfully used in commercial systems that nowadays range from speech recognition, such as uh, Siri in your Apple iPhone, to self-driving uh, autopilot in Tesla. And basically more than 50 years after the, the review uh, that killed Rosenblatt's work, the connectionists and neural networks were finally vindicated. And as you probably know, Lacan, Hinton, and Benjamin received the, the Turing Award for their lifetime work on deep learning. There is also an opinion that, that I personally share that Jürgen Schmidhofer was uh, unjustly excluded from the prize, but at this point, it's already history. So 
In the last bit before I conclude, uh, I would like to briefly talk about graph neural networks. It will be a prominent topic in this course. And um, if the history of symmetry, as we've seen, is tightly intertwined with physics, the history of graph neural networks and graph theory is uh, inseparable from another branch of natural science, which is chemistry. And chemistry has historically been and still is one of the most data in, uh, in the intensive academic disciplines. And uh, the emergence of modern chemistry in the 18th century, when they transitioned from medieval uh, alchemy to uh, a real science, resulted in a very rapid growth of uh, known chemical compounds and uh, an early need for their organization. And uh, this role was uh, initially played by periodicals, so the, the, the German uh, chemist Centrum Blatt, that, that what is one of the oldest journals uh, started uh, appearing in, uh, in the beginning of the 19th century, the first chemical abstract journal, or uh, compendia such as uh, the, the Belstein handbook. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, you can see it here in this picture. So that was a collection of about 500 volumes with half a million pages. So it's just an indication of the sheer amount of data that, that quickly made it impractical to print and use uh, 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 for reference. So in the English speaking world, the Chemical Abstract Service or CAS was created in the beginning of the 20th century in, uh, in uh, 1907. And uh, it has gradually become the central repository for the world's published chemical information. And uh, in the first half of the 20th century, this problem of organizing, searching, and comparing molecules in databases of uh, chemical compounds became of crucial importance, uh, both in academic and commercial use of chemistry. For example, when, uh, let's say, a pharmaceutical company uh, wanted to, to patent a new drug, then the patent office had to verify whether uh, a similar compound had been previously deposited, right? So how do you do it? You need to compare molecular classes in uh, a database. And to address this uh, challenge, several systems for indexing molecules were introduced in the 40s. And this formed the foundation of a new discipline that uh, is now called chemoinformatics. And one such system named uh, uh, GKD Chemical Cipher, uh, named after the authors, Gordon, Kendall, and Davison, 1948. Uh, it was developed uh, the, the English tie from Dunlop and was supposed to be used with uh, early punch card based computers. So you see here an example of a punch card where this kind of uh, information will be encoded, and then presumably you can use this kind of uh, ciphers to better uh, search for molecules. And it's, in essence, uh, it was an algorithm for parsing a molecular structure into a string that could be more easily looked up by a human or uh, an early computer. But uh, these, uh, these ciphers and similar methods were very far from satisfactory, and uh, you need to understand that in chemical compounds, uh, similar structures are often those that result in similar properties. And chemists are trained to basically to, to build an intuition to spot such analogies. So uh, you would look, for example, for aromatic rings for certain chemical groups. And when the molecule is represented as a string, chemically meaningful structures might be lost. As you can see in this figure, you see that, that the molecular structure on the right is a, a substructure of the molecule on the left, but its string representation is uh, very different. So you don't have this local spatial coherence uh, that, that you see in the, in the structure itself. And this realization uh, has led to the development of structural methods for molecule search. And uh, one uh, such famous algorithm is the Morgan fingerprint, which is still used today, maybe in slightly evolved form, that was introduced by Harry Morgan from the Chemical Abstract Service in uh, 1965. And I should say that actually I tried to look him up and from what I find, uh, apparently Morgan uh, didn't work much uh, on science. He soon moved to a management position at IBM, from which he retired, I think, in the 90s. So that was one of his few chemical papers. And in, in this field, uh, a prominent and probably unjustly forgotten figure, a pioneer of chemical informatics, is a Romanian chemist uh, called uh, George uh, Vladutz. So he trained as an organic chemist in the Soviet Union, and his interest in uh, chemoinformatics was triggered 
also by a traumatic encounter with this gigantic uh, Belstein handbook in his uh, first year at course on organic chemistry. So his professor apparently built a barricade of uh, this 500 volume book and said that, that they need to, 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 to learn what is written there. And Vladov sought ways to compare molecular structures represented as graphs. And using techniques in graph theory, which uh, was only developing at that time, uh, to deal with molecules. And uh, you know that this choice should not be surprising because graph theory has been historically tied to chemistry. Even the term graph, in the sense that it's used in graph theory, was first introduced by James Sylvester in 1878 as a mathematical abstraction of chemical structure. So uh, the, the equivalent term he used was a chemical graph. And that was his uh, paper in Nature that year. And uh, Vladovs inspired uh, two young mathematicians, uh, Andrei Lemon and Boris Weisfer, uh, who developed a classical algorithm to determine whether two graphs are structurally equivalent or isomorphic. So basically, two graphs have the same connectivity up to reordering of the nodes. And this is a current problem. And uh, I should say that its complexity was not fully understood at that time. Even the notion of complexity itself was kind of fluid notion in the 60s. Uh, Levin also considered himself a programmer, which was still an exotic profession around that time, and vice uh, was an algebraic geometer. And uh, they worked on a problem that uh, was opposed by Vladovs, at least uh, judging by the acknowledgement in their 1968 paper. Um, they proposed an alternative color refinement scheme that they conjectured to solve the graph isomorphism problem. And it does indeed solve for small graphs up to nine nodes that, that was confirmed by Lemon computationally. But if you go for larger graphs, you can see that uh, there are some counter examples. So uh, for a lot of time, actually, the, the, the complexity of graph isomorphism was uh, unknown. And only recently, uh, last Obama showed that it can be solved in quasi polynomial time. It is usually put into a separate complexity class. Now, these works uh, from the 60s uh, on molecular representation probably remained practically unknown in the machine learning community. And that's one of the reasons why it is really hard to point to a particular point of time when the concept of graph neural networks uh, was created. And in part, it's due to the fact that uh, most of the early works in machine learning didn't really consider graphs as kind of first class citizens. Maybe partially because graph neural networks only became practical in the late uh, 2010s, basically nowadays. And maybe also partially because the field emerged from confluence of uh, several adjacent research areas, whether it's computational geometry, computer graphics, uh, graph signal processing, uh, and so on. So uh, early forms of graph neural networks uh, probably go back to the 90s. Examples such as labeling RAM by Alessandro Sperduti from 19, 1994, or backpropagation uh, through structure by the two Germans, Goller and Kuklev from 96. So, uh, the first proper treatment of the processing of generic graph structure, and uh, also the, the first introduction of the term graph neural networks, happened uh, already in the 21st century. Uh, the University of Siena team that was led by Marco Gori and Franco Scarcelli uh, that first proposed uh, the, the GNNs, as they're currently known. And in this work, they relied on the recurrent mechanism. So it was a kind of a way of generalizing recurrent neural networks to so graph structured uh, data and require the neural network parameters to uh, be configured in a way that they form what is called contractive mappings. So it required uh, a special form of uh, Known representation and that uh, would produce fixed point. Uh, and uh, this required a special form of backpropagation. Uh, so it was a conceptually important milestone, probably not the best uh, neural network architecture. Some of these issues were rectified by a work from 2015, the Gate and GNNs by Lee and Coulthers, uh, that brought many benefits of modern recurrent neural networks that already uh, use techniques from modern deep learning such as gating mechanism and uh, backpropagation through time. And maybe a, a, in some ironical twist of fate, 
modern GNNs were reintroduced, I would say triumphantly, to chemistry, a field there where they originated from by David Duvenon in 2015 uh, as a replacement for the handcrafted Morgan molecular fingerprints. So this is really ironic because the vice for lemon algorithm that was shown uh, in 2018 by Shu and Morris to be uh, equivalent to, 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 to graph neural networks, to message passing graph neural networks, was actually inspired and originated from ideas in chemistry. And then probably one of the most known works in uh, graph neural networks by Jesse Gilmer from Google from 2017, uh, the message passing neural networks uh, were all things just for uh, chemical applications. So again, 50 years have passed and the circle is finally closed. And the last thing I should mention that uh, the field of chemistry or maybe more specifically structural biology, the study of proteins, which are big molecules, has also had its own uh, image that moment at the CASP competition where uh, people try to predict the 3D structure of proteins and uh, the newcomer uh, AlphaFold from DeepMind, first in 2018 and then in 2020, smashed all the competitors. And it was also a geometric architecture that used uh, some of the notions of a group uh, invariance and equivariance that we'll be discussing in this course uh, uh, as the foundation of the architecture. And we'll have a, a guest lecture by one of the developers of AlphaFold too, that will shed more light on how this architecture works. So our historical overview of the genetic foundations of deep learning now naturally brings us to a blueprint that will be underpinning this course. And uh, if we take convolutional and graph neural networks as two prototypical examples, which at the first glance may be completely unrelated, we still see several common trends. And first, both operate on data, such as images in the case of CNNs or molecules, let's say, in the case of GNNs that have some underlying geometric domain. So in the case of images, it's a grid. In the case of molecules, it's a graph. Uh, second, in both cases, the tasks have some natural notion of invariance. So for example, invariance to position of the object in the case of image classification, or let's say the numbering of atoms in the molecule when you try to predict its chemical properties, such as solubility or uh, binding energy. And this can be formulated through appropriate choice of symmetry group. So the translation group in the case of a grid and permutation group in the case of uh, a graph. Uh, third, in uh, both in CNNs and GNNs, uh, we can uh, incorporate the, uh, these symmetries as an inductive bias by making uh, appropriate layers how they interact with the action of the symmetry group on the input. So in CNNs, for example, it comes in the form of convolutional layers, and the output of convolution, as we'll see, transforms in the same way as input. So this is what we call translation uh, equivariance, which is the same as saying that convolution commutes with the shift operator. In the case of GNNs, uh, it comes in the form of a symmetric message passing function that aggregates the neighbor nodes irrespective of their order, and the overall output of message passing transforms in the same way as uh, the permutation of the input. So if, for example, I, I, uh, if I sum the features of the neighbors in a graph, uh, then I don't care about the order of these features in the summation. And last, uh, in some architectural instances uh, of these networks, in particular in convolutional neural networks, we have uh, a multi-scale way of processing the data. So the pooling layers uh, that uniformly subsample the, the grid that underlies the image or in some uh, types of GNNs, uh, it takes the form of graph coarsening. Now, the term geometric deep learning, so we popularize it in the paper uh, in uh, IEEE signal processing magazine is kind of uh, two fold uh, intention to, first of all, apply geometric principles to learning in, on the one hand, and on the other hand, apply learning to data that doesn't have uh, grid-like structures, such as graphs or meshes. And uh, the, the, the extended paper that we wrote with uh, Joan, Petra, and, and Taco, that will uh, become a book with MIT Press 
called genetic deep learning really captures the ideas that, that I'm trying to convey in this course. And maybe somewhat arrogantly, we call this the Erlangen program of machine learning. And uh, it's a way of trying to reconcile the zoo of different architectures that also emerged historically for different types of data uh, developed from different considerations, whether CNNs or GNNs or RNNs or transformers, we'll see that these are just instances of the same blueprint. So we'll be relying on uh, group theory, same way as Klein and his program, uh, to formalize uh, our geometric uh, deep learning blueprint. And we'll be modeling the uh, symmetry structure of the domain uh, by a group that I denote here by G. Its uh, representation will be acting on signals living on the domain that uh, I will be denote here by rho. And then uh, the functions that will define on these signals will incorporate this uh, property in the form of invariance or equivariance. And uh, as an example, we will see in convolutional neural networks the choice of translation group on a grid. Uh, uh, its representation is the shift operator, and an equivariant function is convolution. In case of graph neural networks, the underlying uh, uh, symmetry group is permutation, and the functions take the form of message passing. I should say that uh, the more modern architectures that are used for geometric graphs, or in particular in chemistry, in, in protein folding prediction, such as the alpha fold 2, there is also an extra structure that is symmetry of the data. So if you're familiar with physical concepts, you can uh, make the difference between internal and external symmetry, the symmetry of the field and the symmetry of the, of the space-time. And uh, this takes the form of uh, equivariant message passing or equivariant transformers or equivariant graph neural networks, where we, in addition, have the transformation or equivariance with respect to the, for example, uh, spatial coordinates of the, the atoms in the molecule. So this, uh, again, is a particular instance of this blueprint. And together, these principles give us a very general design that you can recognize in the majority of popular deep neural network architectures. So typically, we apply a sequence of equivariant layers that preserve the structure of the domain, possibly followed by an invariant global pooling layer that aggregates everything into a single output, like an image classification. In some cases, we can also create hierarchy of domains by a coursing procedure, and this is the pooling uh, that is implemented in neural networks. And uh, it is implementation of another very important physical principle that is called scale separation. And this is really what allows physics to work, right? So if you think of uh, a thermodynamical system, so in the uh, microscopic level, we can uh, talk about the quadrillion of molecules that collide and move, uh, uh, let's say, in this room. But if I zoom out and I look at how uh, a thermodynamical system is behaved, I really need just a couple of parameters, such as temperature and pressure, to, desc to describe the properties of gas in a very reasonable way. And if I further move out and look at the cosmic scale, for example, the Earth and all its complicated atmosphere with different pressure and temperature uh, is completely irrelevant when I'm talking about the motion of, uh, of the planet around the sun, right? So in this case, the Earth can really be abstracted as a point. And uh, geometric deep learning blueprint that is based on these two principles of symmetry and scale separation uh, can be applied to different types of domains or geometric structures. We'll obviously see how to apply it on grids. So these are the convolutional neural networks, more general uh, homogeneous spaces, such as, for example, the sphere, uh, also graphs and uh, manifolds, meshes, uh, geometric graphs, and so on. And um, the implementation of these principles basically gives rise to inductive biases that, that leads out to some of the most popular architectures that exist nowadays in deep learning whether it's uh, CNNs that come from translational symmetry, uh, graph neural networks or deep sets of transformers, they all stem from permutation invariants, and uh, intrinsic CNNs that are used in computer graphics and vision that can be derived from uh, gauge symmetry. So we'll talk about it uh, uh, during the course. Uh, what is also cool about geometric deep learning, and in particular about graph neural networks that, that have become 
ubiquitous in a broad range of problems and applications, uh, and uh, really the range is, goes from uh, detecting misinformation and fake news. And uh, uh, this is, for example, a startup company uh, that I co-founded with my students that was acquired by Twitter three years ago, or uh, improving uh, navigation in Google Maps. So that was the work uh, done at Google and DeepMind in which uh, Petra was involved, uh, detecting uh, events in uh, particle colliders. So high energy physics is now prominently using graph neural networks in different uh, ways and for different problems. And some of them are already being implemented in hardware. So we might even see them at some point uh, put in, in the detectors. Uh, Structural biology, so I mentioned uh, alpha folds, so there is a lot of interest in understanding how proteins uh, behave and interact from the standpoint of geometry and geometric machine learning, as well as uh, drug discovery and drug design. So there have been quite uh, impressive progresses in this field in the past few years, including, for example, the famous paper itself about the discovery of new uh, antibiotics using graph neural networks. So to summarize, I think if uh, I started with symmetry as a kind of big idea that, that uh, encapsulates this course, I would like to finish with uh, a quote from Helvetius who said that the knowledge of principles compensates for the lack of knowledge of facts. And this is the kind of idea that I want to, you know, to, to, to have in mind when approaching deep learning. So deep learning is often uh, taught as a collection of hacks. So do this kind of uh, thing and do that kind of thing for that particular problem and that particular data. Uh, we hope to convey a broad set of principles based on which you can understand, first of all, what exists there. So existing architectures and hopefully also design future architectures uh, that are yet to be invented. Now, let me say in the remaining time, a few words about the logistics of the course. So uh, there will be 12 lectures. So after this introduction, uh, you will hear from uh, Joanne about the basics of ML in high dimension. So that will be some kind of common ground. I'm pretty sure that, that some of these things you have heard. So we'll hear about the curse of dimensionality, for example, in a more formal way. But then uh, Taco and Joanne will be talking about geometric priors. We'll hear about uh, symmetry and scale separation. Uh, Petra will be talking about learning on sets and graphs. So that will be uh, mainly uh, towards uh, graph neural networks. We'll uh, then uh, in the seventh lecture talk about grids. So that will be convolutional neural networks devised from first principles. Uh, then uh, more general approach, generalizing this to homogeneous domains, such as the sphere. We'll hear from Taka. I will talk about uh, many faults meshes and geometric graphs. Then Taka will talk about uh, uh, gauges and bundles. Uh, Petra will talk about uh, using category theory as an extension to the Erlangen program. So that's a new lecture actually based on some results from this year. And uh, finally, I will uh, conclude with some applications and uh, open questions and trends. So for most of the course, we'll be following our uh, proto book. So that was uh, the long paper that I mentioned that was published last year. You can find uh, the paper and some materials on this website, uh, geometricdeeplearning.com. And here are some reference to the sections uh, in this uh, paper. And we'll also have uh, several guest lectures from uh, some of the prominent researchers in the field, uh, researchers in the field. So we'll hear from uh, Francesco Di Giovanni from Twitter about GNNs from physical perspective. So how to relate graph neural networks to differential equations and how to derive them as uh, gradient flows of some energy. Uh, from Fabrizio Frasca, we'll hear about uh, subgraph GNNs and uh, this will dive deeper into graph theory and talk about uh, such constructions as the reconstruction conjecture. We'll talk about expressive power, device for 11 tests, and uh, and so on. Uh, Chris Bodner from Cambridge will talk about uh, how to uh, lift graph neural networks to more uh, to richer structures uh, called cellular sheaves, relating uh, GNNs so to diffusion equations on these exotic objects. 
Then Jordi Williamson from the University of Sydney, one of the key uh, experts in representation theory, will connect uh, geometric deep learning to this field. And finally, uh, Russ Bates from DeepMind, one of the authors of AlphaFold 2, will talk about uh, geometric insights in protein folding. So uh, that's it 